Good evening. Thank you for being here. I'm Mike Hazelswert. Over 50 years ago, Paul and Walter Fitzpatrick made a generous gift to Canisius College in remembrance of their father, William H. Fitzpatrick, who was a local political figure. The gift endowed the Fitzpatrick Lecture Series, uh, which we will continue to enjoy tonight. The Fitzpatrick Lecture Series was inaugurated in 1962 with a lecture by former President Harry S. Truman. We are very proud that all Fitzpatrick lectures are free and open to the public. Since then, the endowment has grown, and it now funds not only the lecture series, but the Fitzpatrick Institute of Public Affairs and Leadership. This supports the leadership development of Canisius College students. I am proud to be director of this institute. I want to thank the grandchildren of Paul Fitzpatrick for their continued support. They are represented this evening by Paul and Paula Maloney. Thank you so much. Our speaker tonight will be introduced by Professor Coral Snodgrass of the Department of Management. Professor Snodgrass. Uh, good evening and welcome. Happy to see all of you here tonight. Um, as, as Mike pointed out, I am in the Department of Management. I also run the International Business Program here. So I'm very, very happy to have this discussion going on this evening. It's my honor and my pleasure, actually, to introduce to you Governor Jennifer Granholm, the former two-term term governor of Michigan. Uh, governor Granholm became the first woman to be elected as governor of Michigan in 2002. And in 2006, she was re-elected with the largest number of votes ever cast for governor in the state. She's credited with leading Michigan through a period of unprecedented economic challenge and change. She successfully led efforts to diversify Michigan's economy, pioneering clean energy policy, improving education standards, and creating jobs. After her last term as governor, Governor Granholm began teaching courses in law and public policy at UC Berkeley, where she continues to serve on the faculty. In addition, Governor Granholm is a senior research fellow at the Berkeley Energy and Climate Institute, a project scientist at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, a senior advisor to Correct the Record, and an ABC News contributor. She's also co-author of the political bestseller, A Governor's Story, The Fight for Jobs, and America's Economic Future. She's also an avid supporter of Hillary Clinton's 2016 presidential campaign, and she serves as an advisor on energy policy to that campaign. Governor Granholm is an authority on leadership, politics, economic diversification, clean energy policy, advanced manufacturing, and industrial clusters. And as any of you know who have watched her TED Talk, she is an absolute a woman with a plan on how to bring the states and the private sector together to, on the race to the top in clean energy. I can think of no one who is more qualified to speak to us on the topic of creating clean energy jobs in America. And it is my pleasure to ask you to please welcome former governor of Michigan, Jennifer Granholm. Thank you so much. You all hear me? Yes? Can you all hear me? I am so happy to be here. I was saying to a few of the folks as I was uh, coming in this afternoon, flying in to Buffalo, that it just, it feels like home, because so much of the architecture and the feel of Buffalo reminds me so much of elements of Detroit that it's just, it just feels great to be here, although I haven't, this is my first trip to Buffalo, so thrilled to be part of, uh, of this burgeoning, growing, resurging community, and I'm glad that um, you've also taken on the mantle of trying to diversify into areas that like clean energy. So I want to talk to you about that because I, having gone through um, Michigan at, during a time of huge economic crisis, I know that you can relate when I say that I am totally obsessed with this issue about how to create jobs in America. In fact, there are three problems that I want to talk to you about that are all sort of interconnected. The first one is this loss of middle class jobs. That is the beautiful state of Michigan. How many of you uh, have been to Michigan or, or are from Michigan? <gasps> Anybody from Michigan raising their hand? All right, excellent. 
Um, you'll recognize this, you in the middle. This is the great state, the Upper Peninsula, the Lower Peninsula. And when I was elected as governor, I was elected in 2003. And in 2000, and, I was elected in 2002. I took office in 2003. And at that point, people were saying to me, what a perfect time to be elected as governor because we were just coming out of a national recession. George Bush was the president. For those of you who remember, uh, 2003 was the point at which the economy started to turn around. And people were saying to me, because we had seen such a loss of manufacturing jobs in the, in the years prior, this is the perfect time to come in because by the end of your first year, you will see net job growth. I don't know if you have the same uh, saying, but in Michigan we say when the nation catches a cold, Michigan catches pneumonia. Do you guys have some version of that, right? So it's something like that. And, and we, uh, I mean, for us, because we made cars big things, when somebody's in a recession, right, they aren't buying cars, but when the recession is over, there's pent up demand. And so there's obviously a lot of cars purchased and people were saying this would be a great time. So I figured, great, at the end of my first year, we're gonna be making jobs in Michigan. And that didn't quite happen. So at the end of my first year, I get a call from the guy who's the head of our Michigan Economic Development Corporation. You guys must have a version of that in New York. They work with the private sector, right? It's the state agency. And he calls me and he says, Gov, we got a problem. And I said, what? He said, we have a major employer that is about to move to Mexico. And they, that major employer is Electrolux. They manufacture refrigerators, and they're in this little tiny town of Greenville, Michigan, right in the center of the state. And that little tiny town of Greenville, Michigan, had 8,000 people in it. And the number of people who worked at the Electrolux factory, 2,700. So if you can imagine, this is a one company town, right? when you consider grandparents and children. So I said, so he says to me, they're about to go to Mexico. I said, are you kidding me? I'm the new governor. There is no way we're gonna lose this first big employer under my watch. We're gonna bring, we'll just take all of the cabinet to Greenville and we will make Electrolux an offer they can't refuse. Not like a Chris Christie offer. <laughs> But, you know, we're going to put incentives on the table, stuff like that, right? So I did. It brought my whole cabinet to Greenville. And the city hall of Greenville is, you know, smaller than this stage, I'm pretty sure. And we went in and we, we sat around this big table and all of the poobahs of Greenville were there, the mayor and the city manager and the head of the community college and the head of the UAW who represented the workers and everybody was there and we all said, what can you put on the table to keep them? What can you put on the table to keep them? What can you, so essentially we, we kind of emptied our, our pockets of, of chips and we made a pile and slid our pile of chips across the table to the management of Electrolux. And in this pile of chips were things like zero taxes, state and local, for 20 years. And we would help to build a new factory for Greenville. You'll see this uh, little tiny town, the factory itself was pretty um, sad. And so we were gonna build them, finance the new factory. The UAW, who represented the workers, made such a level of concessions that they didn't want anyone to know how much they were willing to sacrifice to keep the workers. So we just, we had a huge amount of incentives on the table. So Electrolux, in this meeting, they take our, it was a list of incentives, and they walk outside of the room to confer for 17 minutes. And they come back in to our meeting, and they say, wow, that is the most generous offer any community has ever made to try to keep jobs. But there's nothing you can do to compensate for the fact that we can pay $1.57 an hour in Juarez, Mexico. And so we're going. There's nothing you can do. Now, when they said that, this was like a bomb blew up in this community, as you can imagine. Does it sound familiar? Right? So on the last 
the day that the last, or the month that the last refrigerator came off the assembly line, the employees had a gathering that they called the Last Supper. It was at this big community pavilion called Clackle's Orchard Pavilion. It was an indoor pavilion. And I, uh, I went to the Last Supper. Everybody was there. I wasn't invited, but I went anyway because I was so obsessed with these words, there's nothing you can do. And when I went into the room, it was full. And people were sitting around, you know, eight top tables, and they were eating out of box lunches. And there was a sad band playing, or a band playing sad music, probably a sad band as well. But um, I go up to the first table, and the, a guy stands up next to me, and he's got uh, his hair in a ponytail, he's got tattoos, he's got his Detroit Tiger hat on, and he pulls his, he's got two daughters with him, he pulls his two daughters, their teenage daughters, next to him. And he says, Gov, he says, I want you to meet my daughters. He says, I want you to know that I am 48 years old and I've worked in this factory for 30 years. I went from high school to factory. And he said, my father worked in this factory. My grandfather worked in this factory. All I know is how to make refrigerators. And then he looks at his daughters and he puts his hand on his chest like this. He says, so, Governor, tell me, who is ever going to hire me? Who is ever going to hire me? And that question was asked by everybody in that pavilion that day. And it's been asked by every community that has lost factories. This is a picture of the factory, Electrolux factory, being imploded. This is the new factory in Juarez, Mexico. And every community in one of 62,000 of them that lost jobs, that lost factories in that decade, between, or that 13 years between 2000 and 2013, those are all across the country, and you've seen your share. To me, this issue of job loss of loss of middle class jobs, of loss of dignity and identity for people who have worked in those jobs is huge. It's huge in this campaign. And it's huge for us going forward. Those faces and those voices we cannot forget. So look at everybody's been talking about the loss of the middle class, right? The hollowing out of the middle class. Look at this chart. During the, this is the recession, right? The Great Recession. Those medium wage jobs are the jobs that were lost during the recession. And if you look on the right of the chart, the jobs that were gained in the recovery are low wage jobs. You want to know what the hollowing out of the middle class is. It's reflected right there, right? Second problem. So I said I was obsessed with three problems. Problem number one is loss of jobs. Problem number two is climate change and the warming of the planet. This particular uh, chart, the, the dark uh, orange are the record uh, places where you've seen record warming, and the lighter orange is much warmer than average. You know, this is all, we've seen all of this headlines about records. Um, for those of you Jesuits who are here, I am sure that you have read the Pope's encyclical on climate change, Laudato Si, which is so beautiful on the care for our common home. He doesn't even question the science related to climate, but he exhorts us to care for our home. Problem number two, climate change. Problem number three is Congress. All of them are intersecting. So, you all are tired of hearing the polls about how unpopular Congress is. Forget the presidential race. How unpopular Congress is. It's in the single digits, whatever. So there was a polling uh, group that I think this polling group must have some young people in it because they got a, a good sense of humor. They decided they were going to compare Congress's approval rating to the approval rating of a number of unpleasant things. And so they found that, in fact, Congress is viewed worse than cockroaches, dog poop, 
lice, potholes, you can imagine them. They're all trying to think of how bad can we get, right? Root canals, toenail fungus, heroin. Congress is viewed worse than heroin. The band Nickelback. <laughs> Hemorrhoids, ah, what are we gonna do? They also found though, this is the silver lining, that Congress is viewed better, in fact, than meth labs, Charles Manson, and gonorrhea. And I know you're happy I don't have a picture of gonorrhea. <laughs> so, problem number three, Congress, what do we do? What do we do about the loss of jobs, climate change, and a Congress that seems in, unable to do something about it, right? Where are, so this is, this to me is what's exciting about this. How many of you, I'm curious in this audience, how many of you sort of work in or study in the area of clean energy? Okay, only a few, that's great. How many of you are really interested in the subject of clean energy? All right, a lot of hands, good. How many of you are here because you're interested in politics? Okay, a lot. there's some double counting I see happening here. So, so I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about the opportunity so that you can help to sell this to those who represent you, to you know, your, your mother in Youngstown, wherever. This, this to me is so awesome. Okay, so climate change, we know it's a terrible problem, but we also know it's a huge economic opportunity. And why do I say that? Because by 2030, according to respected folks like Pew Charitable Trust and the American Solar Energy Society, one in four jobs globally, 37 million jobs, will be touching on renewable energy. 37 million jobs. Where are those jobs going to be? Buffalo. Where are those jobs going to be? So last year, 2015, there was $103 billion worth of private sector investment in clean energy in China. That's private sector. I'm not talking about state investment. Private sector investment. In the US, it was $44 billion. Just think about this. It's, you know, and this is happening all over the globe. Who, who is going to get the bulk of investment? Well, I don't know if, did any of you read um, George Bush, when he left, he had a great biography called Decision Points. Did any of you read it? All right, two people in the back read it. So for the rest of you, oh, all right, and one over here. For the rest of you, awesome, who, who read it, you might recall there was a story where George Bush describes what he asks uh, guests who come to the White House, like heads of state, uh, as icebreaker. And what he would ask as an icebreaker is, what keeps you up at night? That's what he would ask. So he asks this of, of a number of leaders. He asked it of Hu Jintao, who's the president of China at the time. And what kept George Bush up at night, of course, was the fear of terrorism. That was something that bedeviled him his whole time in office. What Hu Jintao said was, what keeps me up at night is creating 25 million jobs a year for my people. What keeps me up at night is creating jobs for my people. Don't you want leaders who are kept up at night about how to create jobs for your people? Yes, you do. So you can either be at the table or you can be on the menu because these other countries are totally obsessed with getting jobs too. And they are looking at those numbers and they are saying, well, hey, if America is not adopting policy to be able to get clean energy jobs, you better believe we're going to do it while they're slacking off over there. So I'm just saying, you can be at the table or on the menu. I, don't, I prefer to dine. So what can we do? My obsession has caused me to help launch a program at UC Berkeley called the American Jobs Project. And this project is to identify in states across the country uh, we started with the first 10 states, New York is not one of them, sorry about that, but we started with actually um, states that will be influential in this election, states like Virginia and Iowa and Ohio, et cetera, Florida. What are their assets? So for example, there are solar states, there are wind states, there are geothermal states, there are biofuel states, vehicle states, efficiency states, every state's got something to offer. Right? Every state has something to offer. And so the American Jobs Project 
has um, given me the opportunity to share some of the observations from the research. This is just some, and it's, this is sort of general for an audience where there may not be um, people who are really deep diving into energy, although there are some technical issues that I think are really cool. So the no observation number one is, do not focus on climate change because you don't get consensus about it. Focus on jobs. We all know climate change is happening, but if you want to sell it, focus on jobs. So every year, Pew Charitable Trust does a survey of the public's priorities, and this is what it looks like for 2016. The economy and jobs are at the top, climate change is at the bottom. Lesson number one, just focus on the issue, right? Describe it in a way that you can sell it to people. Focus on jobs. You can still obviously get to the climate change issue. So how do you focus on jobs? And you guys know this in Buffalo. First of all, there are three strategies that are the smartest strategies that communities and states can do to focus on jobs, particularly in the climate arena. One is enhance your industrial clusters. And that means to nurture and recruit companies that need your existing natural resource base or your existing companies, your existing industrial base. So just as an example, in Michigan, I was saying this to the students who I was talking with earlier, we focused on batteries for vehicles. We built car 1.0, so we were gonna build car 2.0, and that meant the guts to the car 2.0, and that meant the electric vehicle battery, right? Made sense for us. And what did that mean? That meant that we had to uh, attract the supply chain for that battery. And what does a battery have? It's got an anode, it's got a cathode, it's got separator material, it's got electrolyte. There's a whole supply chain about what goes into a battery for an electric vehicle. We didn't have any of those companies. So I went to, I went to China, I went to Korea, I went to Japan, because most of them were in Asia, and we got a supply chain built out for the electric vehicle battery in Michigan, because it built on our existing industrial base really critical to have an electrified vehicle system for this whole climate change, clean energy economy. Second strategy for job creation in states is to nurture and recruit companies that produce complex products. Products where you have to have R&D and manufacturing side by side. Because you can win those in the, fight, in the global fight. Because we've got R&D hands down. And so for example, Ohio is one of our states they should be building the machines that help to create efficient products. So for example, that's a picture of a digital printer. Do you know what a digital 3D printer is? Some of you are nodding, some of you aren't. So let me just give you an example. A 3D printer is, you know, you've got your printer that prints on paper, but a 3D printer prints 3D. So for example, if you want to build a car door, so the old way would be you put your car door, you put your, your, your uh, sheet of steel down, you cut out the door from, for the car, right? Then you have all this extra steel after you lift it up that you've cut out. It's wasteful. A 3D printer allows you to put a substrate into a big printer like this, or bigger, and it builds the car door bit by bit through a liquefied substrate often that, that hardens and dries, but it is the way that the computer prints it out, it prints it out with the window, it prints it out so that it is configured exactly because it's got software in it to the car. So you have no waste at all. It's an efficient manufacturing process. Why shouldn't Ohio or other states that do manufacturing be building those 3D printers, right? And who's going to be put to work but Americans in building those printers? The third strategy would be to nurture and recruit companies that are building products that are too fragile or too heavy to ship. So for example, in Virginia, one of the states that we looked at, Virginia was interested in doing offshore wind. Have you ever seen one of these offshore wind turbines? I mean, you've seen the ones that are in farms, right? The offshore wind turbines are massive. They're just massive. So difficult and expensive to ship them across a boat. You can't put them on the freeways. They're just too huge. So the opportunity for Virginia is to build them right there where they will be erecting them into the Atlantic Ocean. That's a huge jobs opportunity. So, so that observation is to focus on jobs and to focus on industrial clusters. Second observation from this is that energy and efficiency will be both ubiquitous and invisible. 
going into the future. This, I, I love the future sort of trend stuff. So for example, this is an easy one. You all know there are buildings probably like this that are just programmed to, to deal with clim their, the climate, the internal climate. You don't have to think about it. Or you could walk in and something motion detects, right? Your lights go on, your climate goes, your climate, uh, your heater, your cooler goes on. That's so sort of easy. Or the software in your system tells your washing machine when to go on at the cheapest point. All of that is happening without you even thinking about it. It's a way to be efficient about your use of energy, right? All enabled by something called the Internet of Things. Have you heard of that? No. Awesome. Okay, so the Internet of Things takes dumb products and makes them smart. Attaches software, hardware and software together. So for example, a solar panel sitting on a roof without anything else happening, you know, it sends its ions through the system, but it's kind of dumb. It just sits there. A smart solar panel would be able to rotate with the sun so that it captures the solar rays at the optimal every single moment of the day. Same thing with wind turbines. Wind turbines sit up there, they just rotate, but if they were smart, they would rotate with the wind, right, to capture the maximum amount. So the Internet of Things allows objects to be optimally used, and it's all through the blending of hardware and software together. All right? You see those GE commercials, you know, where the young woman is talking about the robot that's talking? It's all about the Internet of Things. Or, as they say in the engineering department at Berkeley, IoT. That's, you'll, you'll get that acronym. IoT, very important by IoT. So, when I say ubiquitous and invisible, for example, the next generation of solar, that little panel right there that is being held in the hand, that has, that's got solar paint on it. Organic solar paint. You can't even see it. Or, I mean, this is actually kind of an older building up here with solar all over it. But these Spanish tiles are all solar panels. You know, you're going to see solar panels that are bendable, that can attach to anything, that can attach to the, you know, to anything that any surface at all and will be invisible to you. So you won't even know it, but it's still generating power. Same thing with small wind, a little, little uh, less invisible. But small wind, these are, this is a stackable, these are stackable wind turbines. And they can go like in any urban setting, making a fence. Those little, those holes right here are long and deep. It creates what is known as the Venturi effect. As the wind goes through, it gets faster and it generates more energy. So even in low wind environments, you can see architects now creating wind turbines inside of buildings in a way that you don't even know that they're wind turbines. And this is for you business people out here, you business students and people. What does it mean for states? This is, this is the demand chart for wind penetration of the U.S. and the projections for where it will be by the year 25, uh, 2050. Whenever you see demand charts, the growth going up, you know it's a good business opportunity, right? Same thing with solar. This is what it looked like between 2006 and 2015 in terms of the growth. This is the projection depending on the, uh, on the trajectory, on the assumptions for between 2015 and 2030, but it's basically doubling huge growth opportunity for anybody who cares about going into business. And this ridiculously messy chart is just to show you, this is the United States in this first line right here, and this, um, this group right here is in, in investors who are entrepreneurs, and they are saying that climate investment for the states, for the, for the globe, the number one place of an opportunity for next generation investment in climate technology is in the United States. The number one. So why do I say this to you? Because what it means for states is jobs. The third observation, third observation from our research is that everything, not everything, but a lot of things are going to be distributed. And what I mean by that is not only is energy generation going to be distributed on rooftops rather than the big power plants, right? You'll see big power plants doing it as well, but a lot of energy will be energy <laughs> energy generation will be distributed on rooftops and on commercial buildings, but the manufacture of products will also 
be distributed. So you remember I was talking to you about those wind turbines. This, this particular chart shows what the optimal size of the future wind turbine will be compared to what it has been. And here's the problem when you have optimal wind turbine size, is that you cannot transport a wind turbine like that. So this first, this first, this is what a wind turbine blade looks like being transported on the freeway, right? Really hard to turn the corner, and that's just a basic blade. That's not those optimal blades that I'm showing you right here on the right. Now this is the problem, is that the optimal wind turbine has a diameter that is too big to be transported under bridges. It's just really big. So what does this mean? How do you get these things put up then? Well, manufacturing will be distributed. And so by that I mean you're not going to have one big factory potentially. What you're going to have is processes that bring in the steel, that do a, a spiral weld uh, that's finished at a wind farm and that's just put up right on site. And so who's going to build all that equipment? Who's going to put up those wind turbines? Those are all jobs, all jobs for our people if we have the right policies to incentivize them. Even, this I love because it was from the Detroit Auto Show last year, and the, the expectation was that you would have 3D printed cars, the whole car would be 3D printed like I just was talking about, within a year. That this company, Local Motors, would be building micro factories around the country to do these 3D printed cars. Now, that was supposed to have been done within a year, it's about a year later and we haven't seen it, but it's, I'm telling you, this is the future. Distributed manufacturing, or this I love. So I went to this company in California, this entrepreneur, and they were taking trash, like putting it in your trash compactor at home, they press a button, shh, out the other side, comes gasoline for your car. Okay, would you love that? <laughs> it's a biofuel gasoline that is much better for the environment, but the process itself creates a distributed opportunity for vehicle fuel. Now, that is the wave of the future, is that you're gonna see all of this distributed activity. So what does this mean for states? Is that states that are quick to recognize the clean energy as the business opportunity of the century are the ones that are gonna create jobs. States that are slow are gonna see the jobs lost to the states that are fast and to other countries. So just California is an example of this. They've got 40,000 companies right now in California because they have the right policy in place to be able to incentivize the growth of this. 500,000 people right now working, or last year, working in California in the clean energy industry. You guys, I mean, New York, and we'll talk about this in a second, has this reforming the energy vision. And you've got your great plant that is going up. And I know there's been a little bit of kerfuffle about what's happening. Is it Panasonic? Will Tesla survive? Will they take over? All of that. I am just saying, this is so fantastic for Buffalo, right? I mean, assuming it's, it's, it's and I, I know it's going to last because you see those numbers of demand for solar. It, the demand is not going away. They have to figure out the cost issues, but it is going to be fantastic for Buffalo to be able to do this. The Giga, Giga Factory, you know, I think Elon Musk loves Giga Factories because he did a Giga Factory for batteries in Nevada, and he's doing this Giga Factory now he will be acquiring to revive your manu manufacturing sector. We'll see if the job numbers come in at that, but nonetheless, that is a huge opportunity for suppliers as well to be able to provide services and products to the factory. Um, and you've got this REV, this reforming the energy vision. N New York is seen, along with California, as the two leading states in clean energy innovation in terms of policy. So what are you doing? So the, the reforming the energy vision goals First of all, by 2030, you are supposed to get 50% of your electricity generated from renewable sources. What does that do? What does that do? It creates what? Jobs and demand, right? You've got, you got to create the demand first, and then the jobs flow. So 50%, if you're committed to getting 50% of your energy from renewable sources, you've got to have something that is supplying that source. And so, you guys here, in Buffalo are going to be making the solar panels as one component of that. 
The other goal that you have is a 40% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from 1990 levels. That will um, go together, obviously. If you have 50% of your energy from renewable sources, you'll get your greenhouse gas numbers down. And this one, a 23% reduction in energy from buildings by 20, of the 2012 le levels by 2030. So you'll have to really be building or deploying, installing products that help buildings to conserve energy, both homes and commercial. Where are those products going to be built? I'm just saying, you're going to need the right windows. You're going to need the right insulation. You're going to need the right HVAC systems. You're going to need the Internet of Things so they all talk to one another. So you've got smart buildings. You have to Think about how you're going to meet that demand and what the opportunity is in New York via policy. Look at this fantastic vehicle and model. <laughs> that is the Volt. That was my, I bought the first generation of, or rent, at least, the first generation of Volts that came off the line, of course, made in uh, Michigan with the batteries that we brought. But the batteries, this energy storage, is the mother load of clean energy opportunities for jobs. It really is. Why is that? Because the sun is not always shining. And if you have solar panels on your house, what are you going to do at nighttime when you need your electricity? If you don't have some energy stored up, right? And that's just a microcosm of your house, but the whole utility system is the same. You have to be able to store it. Same thing, wind blows a lot at night. And if you have wind and solar together, you might have part of your answer, but it's intermittent, right? So you need to have storage that can be releasing the renewable energy when you need it. And that's why batteries, lithium ion batteries, other kind of batteries are huge. Energy storage is huge. So you've got energy storage happening in these electric vehicles, Tesla, Obviously, the uh, next generation of Tesla, the next generation of the Chevy Volt is the Bolt, and the Bolt's going 300 miles on a charge like the Tesla does. If you're going 300 miles on a charge, that really, you don't need much more than that. If you're plugging it into your garage at night, like I plug my Volt in, and I get up in the morning, and I could go 300 miles. I don't need any second car. I'm, I'm good, unless I'm going a super long distance, and then I need a charging station somewhere along the way. <laughs> I love this. Now they're going to put batteries on the roof and embed it into the panels of cars. And those panels will all be 3D printed. <laughs> and so the batteries will be, and they're flexible batteries, they're inside your car, they're, in, they're on top of your car, all storing and generating uh, energy. And so you're going to see this. This is a flexible battery. Now remember I said the solar panels are going to be flexible. The batteries are going to be flexible too. You, this is a battery that is actually made at, at UC Berkeley and you can wrap it around the pipes of your car to help um, store the heat energy and save it for when you need it. In fact, batteries, you're going to be able to like on your, your um, you know, if you, had an, uh, if you were carrying a phone or an iPad, the battery, the generation from, they're, they're making batteries now where, the, where you, your body heat, will be able to be uh, stored in batteries and generate the power to be able to power the device itself. It's all so awesome. But here's what I want to point out for you guys. Batteries plus solar together makes this irresistible combination. And this is why Elon Musk is so brilliant about it. So he's made this gigafactory in, in, in uh, Nevada because he sees that energy storage is the mother load. He is no dummy. He's actually doing that gigafactory. You all think it's for vehicles. Actually, he's doing, I think, the battery in stackable form so that he can sell energy storage to utilities all across the country. And he wants to combine the solar panel with a battery potentially on the back so that you sell both a battery and the solar panel together. It's genius. It's genius. And you guys are the epicenter of it. Buffalo, New York is the epicenter of it. It's awesome. Do you get it? <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> it really is. It's so fantastic. So what does it mean for states is that batteries are going to be able to 
fit anywhere. They're going to make renewable energy reliable. They're going to be ubiquitous. And the question is, who is going to build and sell the batteries? And we're not going to get them you know, stamped, made in Korea. We're going to make them here. We're going to make them in the United States. And let me just show you, this is, my, this is the cost of batteries and how the costs have dropped. And this is the demand and the estimates for demand of batteries going up. I'm just saying, if you're a business person, those are two graphs you really like. And you see the opportunity for huge profit. And for states, you see the opportunity for huge jobs. It's all about the batteries. Observation number five, I only have two more, just quickly. Number five is climate, we, if we use the right language, if we, use, if we use the thrust to create jobs, you can see conservatives and liberals agreeing. So for example, freedom, energy freedom. You should be free to put solar panels on your house and generate your own energy. It should give you the power to do that, right? You should be free to be able to do that. It's about competition. You want to make sure that competition exists in the energy markets to give you the best opportunity as a customer to decide what you want to do to create and generate your own energy. You don't want to be held hostage just to the big utilities. You want to be able to decide it on your own. You want to create jobs. You want to have consumer choice. You want to make sure that we are secure as a nation, that we, we are not getting our oil or our energy from other countries, that we're doing it on our own. You want energy independence. In fact, it's super pro-local business. All of these are words that Democrats and Republicans can sign on to. All of these are, is language that we can get consensus on in a bipartisan way. In fact, streamlining bureaucracy is another one. If you want to get the cost of solar panels in the U.S. is more expensive than in other countries because of the bureaucracy associated with it. Let's streamline the permitting process. Get out what they call the soft cost costs for solar panels so that we're really competitive. In fact, California just did this whole new cutting of solar permitting red tape. And California is known as the biggest bureaucratic state in the country by many. If California can do that, other states can do it as well to get those soft costs away from solar. And if you're skeptical about whether conservatives and liberals can agree, just look at Florida. Earlier this year, a coalition tried to get on the ballot. They were not successful, but what I want to point out to you is that the coalition existed. The coalition was the Tea Party Network, Greenpeace USA, the Libertarian Party of Florida, the Republican Liberty Caucus of Florida, the Sierra Club of Florida, the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy, and the Christian Coalition. All of them put a ballot, want, tried to put a ballot proposal on so that Florida, the sunshine state, could actually allow its citizens to put solar panels on their roof that were up owned by a third party. The utilities defeated them. But the coalition existed, and I think they will come back and be successful next time. My point is that conservatives and liberals can agree on this. And the last observation that I want to make is that competitions really work. And what do I mean by that? So, um, wait, shoot, I showed you my line. I was, I'm asking you this question and you saw it, but my question would be what was the most effective Obama policy that got states to voluntarily make policy changes? And the, it was race to the top for education. And why do I say that? It's because what the Obama team did was they put early on uh, $3.4 billion on the table and they said to us governors, okay, you want to vie for a piece of this $3.4 billion? All you have to do is get your legislature to increase your standards so that every child in high school is essentially taking a college prep curriculum. They said, you don't have to come into this competition, but if you do come in, that's the price of entry. You know how many states participated? Not all, but almost all. 48 states competed, 48 governors convinced 48 state legislatures to raise their high school standards. What this policy did was essentially create national, national education policy, but from the bottom up, from the state level. What were the two states that didn't participate? Can you guess? Texas. 
<laughs> it's always Texas. Texas and one more. I don't hear it. South Carolina. Texas and South Carolina were the two that did not participate. But I'm telling you, it was a big deal for us govs. We were all like, heck yes, we're going to get some of that money. Um, so why do I raise this? Because competitions get politicians' juices flowing. So Google, private sector competition, you might remember this, they put out a challenge and they said to cities across the country, hey, if you agree to be a Google fiber city and change your permitting structures so that we can lay our fiber cable easily, then we will come and lay fiber. But you have to compete for it by telling us that you're going to change your permitting processes, right? You know how many states, cities competed? 1,100 cities competed just for the designation of being a Google Fiber City. And they were, it went crazy. There were only a handful that were picked, but they went crazy. Like, so there were cities where the city council like, went out into the cornfield and laid in the shape of the Google logo and had a, you know, an aerial photograph taken to demonstrate how committed they were to being a Google city, a Google Fiber city. 34 cities got it out of the 1,100. So all I can say is, you know who this is? <laughs> All right. Respect the states. This is how you go around Congress. Or this, this is how you entice Congress to entice the states. Respect the states. Empower the govs. Create a muscular, clean energy jobs race to the top. That's what I say. This is what I've been pushing for. And so I'm happy to report that, now this is not a campaign, but I'm, I'm, this is not a campaign pitch at all. This is a nonpartisan issue. But I'm just saying one of the candidates at least has this very policy. And isn't it great? It is a $60 billion challenge. Remember what it took to get 48 states? $3.4 billion. She's got a $60 billion challenge to cities, cities and to governors to demonstrate what they can do to create jobs and reduce their carbon, their CO2 footprint. And they don't have to compete. But if you, for example, if, you know, Florida, which doesn't have a renewable portfolio standard at all, which doesn't have a commitment to renewable energy, you know, if they come in saying that they're going to get 20% or 30% of their energy from renewable sources, you better believe they can have access to some of those funds to be able to make sure that they can attract job providers or do what they need to make sure that they are successful. It's awesome. But you know what else she's got in this? For Buffalo, this should make a big difference for you. A, five, a commitment to put 500 million solar panels on homes across the country. 500 million solar panels. And you can better believe that she does not want solar panels to be stamped made in China and put on homes here. She's going to want solar panels that are made in the USA. Hmm. Hmm. Who could benefit from that? I don't know. So I say stoke investment and innovation by triggering the competitive juices of us politicians through policy that comes locally, right? That creates local incentives. So the question for us all is who can get the political parties to reach consensus? Who can create prosperous middle-class jobs? Who can address these three problems? Who can save our planet from death and destruction? Is it Elon Musk? Is it Governor Cuomo? Is it the Pope? <laughs> Is it our next president, whoever she is? <laughs> or, or is it you all, Canisius and Buffalo? You could be the change. Thanks all so much. Now, I know we have about, um, 20 minutes or so for questions and um, hopefully some answers. And if there are questions that I don't know the answer to, I know we've got a couple of experts out here who might be able to, to help out as well. So happy to answer any questions that you may have about this or anything else. Yes, sir. Wait, now let me ask you, there's a, there's a here. I'll give you my mic, but 
for, for everybody, there's oh, sure. uh, Okay. Uh, I'm wondering about uh, the lithium ion battery problem as, I mean, since the batteries you're talking about seem to be mostly of that type, what's going to be done to prevent these things from blowing up? Yeah. Well, first of all, let me just say there were a couple of examples, of early examples of problems with the lithium ion batteries. They are working on them 24-7. I think they are sort of one-off problems. I don't think it's going, I mean, most uh, experts, like 99%, say this is not going to be an issue as long as you've got good um, management in terms of climate management, uh, you know, heat management inside of vehicles as well as inside of utilities if they're doing big-scale batteries. I don't think that, that problem will be resolved through technology and through taking these to scale. There's also other types of energy storage in addition to lithium ion. There's air storage. I mean, there's all sorts of things happening in the research and development side of things that batteries will be um, of all nature being able to store energy. So lithium ion is one. Lithium ion is the most efficient and it's the best for vehicles, but it's not the only one and it's, it's gonna be resolved. I wouldn't worry about that. Other, other questions? Governor Granholm. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. You are just great. Oh, uh, bless your heart. Thank a you. question a lot of people want to know. Do you stand with the Standing Rock Sioux in opposition to the Dakota Access Pipeline? Yes, I do. I do. Uh, you know, I think, here's what I think on the, on the pipeline issue. I think uh, in all things, we should be erring on the side of generating more renewable energy rather than generating more fossil fuel energy. And pipelines facilitate the generation of fossil fuels, fossil fuel energy. Um, we are seeing that the costs of renewables are dropping to grid parity and below, especially wind in, in particular is very, very cheap. We ought to be doing everything we possibly can to keep fossil fuel energy in the ground and developing the renewable side. So, other, other questions, yeah. So what are we going to do about getting those fossil fuel companies to start to focus on renewables? Because they're yeah. wasting their money on those pipelines. Yeah, you know, this, this is why, um, why I show these graphs. Because business people, if they've got their green eye shades on, no matter what kind of company they're in, but if they're in a fossil fuel company and they want to diversify, and some of them are, right? Some of them really are moving into this and they see this on the horizon and they don't want to be um, dragging their feet, but some of them are foot draggers. But they've got distribution systems, especially when you think about um, you know, vehicles um, and renewable fuels. They're, it's a huge opportunity for fossil fuel CEOs to see this as a way to expand and not as a threat, to see it as an opportunity and not as a threat. And I think that um, because the United States has made this great commitment and a global commitment in Paris to reducing our reliance on, uh, to reducing our CO2 emissions by 26 to 28 percent by 2030, we, we have got to lead in demonstrating that we're going to do that, and that means putting the policy pieces in place to do it. So that means producing cars that are more fuel efficient. That means the electrification of fleets of vehicles. It's not going to be available for everything, but it will be available for an awful lot. And once they see the demand um, going down because there is more reliance on fossil, on um, uh, electrification, you know, the, it's, the writing is on the wall. It's just a question of how soon they see it. But policy can help push them in that direction. Um, I'm actually, oh. Wow. Um, I'm from Michigan as well, so um, yeah, I'm Where from Harbor Springs. Oh. Um, Harbor yeah. Springs, if you haven't gone on a vacation to northern Michigan, Harbor it's Springs a is <laughs> a magical place. Um, and I know a lot of my friends that are um, like in the area, um, I think it's Pipeline 2 maybe, that, um, that goes underneath the Straits of Mackinac. How, I know that there's been a lot of like controversy with that, but nothing's really changed. How do you think like stuff like that is going to be changed that's already in place that poses threats to like things right, like the Great right. Lakes, like is that up to like government or what do you, what do you think? So, so what do? you have, yeah, it is. It, I mean, governments need to make sure that the pipelines are safe. Obviously the companies have to make sure the pipelines are safe as well. You know, um, there has to be partnership to make sure that the existing pipelines are not leaking, whether it is leaking oil in that case or natural gas, you know, you've got these, this methane leakage problem with a lot of the natural gas pipelines. 
you know, there, there has to be a commitment and punishment for those who are allowing this to happen because the methane, the molecule of methane is so much worse for the atmosphere than a molecule of CO2. I mean, you've got, you've got the carbon emissions, uh, are, the methane is so much more toxic that um, we've got to both do carrots and sticks for companies who are responsible for pipelines. Make sure that they seal them up and seal them up so there's no leaks. And if there are leaks, we've got to do enforcement that makes them clean it up. Some of them are better than others, I will say that. But I think part of, um, you know, I know, uh, you know, I can't speak for, the, I'm sure the, uh, both campaigns probably have policies to address stuff like that. Um, I just know on the Clinton side, she has a whole strategy with respect to making sure that the pipelines are, that exist are not leaking and that we, we uh, lessen our reliance so that we don't have to build more pipelines into the future. We uh, currently have like three grid you, systems. Wait, but as everybody comes up, tell me your name, oh, yes. rank, serial number. Oh. <laughs> Gary Gleba. I'm Gary? retired. <laughs> so. right. We currently have three electric grid systems in the United States, which are quite antiquated and not well integrated. I guess the question is, how do you foresee the development of the smart grid? Would you propose nationalizing the grid system? It's a big problem. That's a yeah, so the grid system, you know, these big transmission lines and substations all across the country. They're actually, they're operated, you know, their utilities use them, obviously, and they cross geopolitical lines, and it's a big challenge. So you almost have to think of the transmission lines across the country like you think of the highway system, so that you, you have a national commitment to a smart grid. And when we say smart grid, again, using the Internet of Things analogy, you want a grid that is able to send energy when you need it, the right kinds of energy to the places when you need it, using something called demand response, right? But you have to have software, you have to build a new system for that. So there has to be national investment. Otherwise, there has to be national investment in the grid system. You've got to be able to take all of the wind that's being generated, for example, in, in Montana, in North and South Dakota, you've got to be able to deliver it to places where there's less wind so that you distribute the renewables around. You can't do it unless you have a transmission system that is smart and up to date. And so, yes, there has to be a commitment to that. One of the, you know, again, I don't mean to make this campaign related, but I can just say on the Clinton side of things, I just don't know the Trump side, but she's got a commitment to $500 billion in infrastructure and a big commitment to transmission investment. Part of the transmission problem is that it crosses all sorts of property, right? And you have to be respectful of individual rights, and so property rights. And so how can you do a transmission system that gets across the country in an efficient way without trampling on property rights? That has what been the block for these transmission lines to be upgraded as it is. And so that particular pickle, that's the pickle that is harder than even the dollar amount for investment. And that, I think, is going to require some super smart um, people and uh, commissioners at the Federal um, Energy Regulatory Commission that know how to, to go through that. But a lot of it will have to go through public lands, I think. Uh, thank, thank you for the, giving us a, a positive, hopeful vision for slowing down climate change. But we know that the effects are here already very severely. They're going to increase um, in magnitude and, and frequency. I think two or three up there was jobs, and then you, about 33 or something was climate change. What can you see in, in terms of jobs and in, in that to pre prepare for the effects of climate change? You mean beyond building like solar panels or wind turbines? More than that, you mean? Well, well, those are great to prevent further climate change. I'm talking about preparing for the effects that we can no longer prevent. Right. There's a lot of effects coming. I'm wondering if there are jobs that you could see or, or yeah, address that. Yeah, I mean, that. I, 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 I absolutely think that there are jobs associated with that, but it's almost like, um, you know, you don't want to focus as much on that because it might tell some people, well, just let it happen because jobs will be created anyway. You know, it's sort of like saying you'll get more funeral directors, you know. I, 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 although I do think that in that climate sustainability and mitigation 
will create jobs. I mean, for example, in states that have, that are bordering on the oceans, obviously you've got either levees that have got to be built up or shorn up, or there has to be movement of populations, you know? And that's a scary thing to say, but one way or the other, unless we stop this and, and rev, you know, can we reverse any of it? There's a lot of people who are talking about carbon negative products, so which actually remove CO2 from the atmosphere now. And so can you, can you really double up on the kind of products that will actually take carbon out? And so, or, or, or um, bio solutions, so the planting of trees, et cetera, that can help to remove carbon. So that's another way of, of, of mitigation, if you will, that actually creates jobs that I think people would be excited to hear about. But I think either way, you know, on the bad side, you may have jobs created that you don't want to be created, but you can still be active in planting trees and in using, using the agricultural uh, strategies to be able to remove CO2. No. Okay, I'm going to go back over this side for okay. a sec, I think, and then I'll come back to you, sir. Um, thank you, Governor Granholm, for coming. Yes. My name is Colleen Hanna, and I'm retired from an energy company, but my question um, is different. I want to know, what do you think is the probability that if Mr. Trump wins the election, that he'll get on board with any of this stuff? That he'll what? That he'll get on board with this stuff that you've been talking about? I don't know. <laughs> it's my biggest fear, honestly. Uh, this you know. just said nobody knows what he's going to do. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, again, I'm, I'm trying to be respectful of the nonpartisan nature of this, of this talk. I know what he has said, you know, that climate change is a hoax or whatever. I just think that once somebody's in office, you have to, you have to, you are faced with the reality of governing. And the reality of governing is so serious, and especially when you consider the impacts of climate that we are seeing on a daily basis. I mean, today, in, in Buffalo, I mean, how often has it happened that you've had you know, a November 1st that's, you know, that's in the 60s. I mean, and some people in the North, I mean, we used to joke in Michigan, oh, it won't be so bad for us, you know. But, uh, you know, that's, it's not funny when you've got super storms and when you've got droughts and when you've got to deal with all, with FEMA paying out lots of dollars and, you know, uh, insurers who have to insure over, under insure, over the, the crises that they are expecting. I think that once you get in office, no matter who it is, you have to understand this, the, gravi you know, the gravitas of the office and what your people are experiencing. And I think it would um, make anybody wise up, at least. I say this as a good Catholic, uh, that's what I would hope. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> we, got, we, we have this legacy of fossil fuels and nuclear fuels uh, you know, Governor Cuomo has just is trying to give eight billion dollars to uh, the nuclear fuel industry to maintain three power plants, possibly four in New York State, and that's coming out of our pocketbooks uh, starting next year if if it goes through. Um, you know, this nuclear. What are we going to do with nuclear power plants? I mean, there, half of them in the country are losing money hand over fist, and uh, the, a lot of them are closing, and yet. You know, uh, while they produce electricity, they're not producing CO2, they're not producing methane. Uh, you know, should we, as a national policy, have, start a closure of, you know, uh, 10 or 15 years of all nuclear power plants in the United States? The, the spent nuclear fuel problem is enormous. Yeah, um, this, is, this, is, this is a really hard one. Um, we know that, you know, in France, for example, they have almost all nuclear because it's 100% it's clean. Can we get quickly enough to a renewable future to be able to meet all of our energy needs? And if you don't have nuclear in the mix some way, does it not, um, do you have a problem because you rely more on fossil fuels? So I ultimately, this is me speaking, I, I think that nuclear must be a piece of things until we get to that renewable future that we would all like to see. Um, but the question is how soon? You are totally right that at the moment, it is not from a cost benefit analysis, the industry is not going to be making money. So I, you haven't seen new nuclear plants commissioned. There's a lot of talk of these small modular 
nuclear plants that people have talked about. Actually, I shouldn't say that because Georgia has a, a nuclear plant that they are now working on, but it's, it's an example of a plant that is new and way over budget. And so they haven't cracked the code, if you will, on how to do nuclear in a way that is cost effective and 100% safe. And so I think that uh, the existing plants will still be in the mix for a while until we get to this future. Ultimately, though, we'd love to see a much more robust renewable future. But, you know, supporting nuclear power plants also inhibits the penetration of renewables. It, because every, right. the supporting nuclear power, because when they put out on the market for that kilowatt hour, that kilowatt hour is not bought from wind or solar. Right, right. It's the same issue, right? It's the same issue, the flip side. The only, the only silver lining on the nuclear side is that it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have CO2. That's the, that's the issue. But I don't, I don't think there's an easy resolution for that one yet. But I appreciate you raising it because it's a tough one we're going to have to figure out. Yes, sir. Yes, with the... Name, name. Alex. I forgot to get your name too, sir. Alex. Um, with the growing need and demand for these ion batteries and everything that's going to go into them, what exactly is being taken to affect the child miners that have been part of the companies and everything else? So essentially with this exponential growth in demand, do we realize the costs that aren't going to be domestic? Right. So this is a great question because I think it gets um, on a broader level to our to trade issues, right? This is why if you are going to do lithium-ion batteries, um, you know, we need to have access to a supply of lithium, right? And is that something that um, we can develop in some way? Do we have to, who are we trading with to get it? It gets to this bigger issue that is part of the campaign right now about how we enter into trade agreements that make sure that our trading partners are abiding by the standards that we would have them abide by. And that means no child labor, no unfair labor practices, no externalizing of the costs of energy, uh, of, uh, you know, releasing CO2, uh, no, you know, no dumping of steel, et cetera. We want to make sure that we enter into trade agreements that meet the goals of everybody. And if we're going to buy lithium from somewhere else, you want to buy them from entities that are treating people in the way that we would treat them. This is why I think on this camp, on this election, people have focused so much on trade for that very reason, which is a super important reason, which hit Michigan particularly hard, which has hit Buffalo particularly hard, and which I believe that our next president, regardless of whether it's uh, Clinton or Trump, will focus on um, and be tough about. Hi there. Uh. Was I supposed to go back over here? Did I? I wait, uh, hang on just I, one second. You second. can do that. That's fine. Let me just be fair to the sides. I'm Kathy Castillo. Um, I'm, well, we were briefly acquainted in Northwest Detroit 100 years ago. And Wait. so, well, anyway. Who are you? Um, Kathy Castillo. Dan Mulhern was on oh the. My gosh. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Are you here you. now? Yeah, we've been here a long time. Awesome. I'm from here. Anyway, Dennis is from Detroit. My kids are from Detroit. Well, thank I you. I knew that's, I felt home here. That's, that's nice. awesome. So, um, it, yeah, well, two things. One is our friends outside of Detroit were much more conservative, and it was the only, you as governor were the only governor that I could imagine that they actually had great respect for and just said, what is she going to do? It's just too hard. So it was a remarkable governorship that you had because uh, you had everybody behind you in spite of the fact that you had an impossible task. And... Um, yeah, it. they're a tough bunch to, to keep happy, so. <laughs> all voters are tough to keep happy. Right? And, uh, and <laughs> so. You're all grumpy. <laughs> and so the, the other thing is, though, living in Detroit, you realized how wide the, the streets were and how, how it was made around cars. It's, it's, um, it, it was its downfall as yep. well as its yep. success, right? It right. was a victim of its own success. Yes. And so I always think about trains and I think about ways in which we could have, um, uh, a better use of public transit. Do you guys and have so I wonder if that's here? something, pardon me? Is there transit in Buffalo? Is, do you guys have public transit? Well, yeah, we have buses and we do have, have one line that comes a, down you Main Street. Line. You got buses. One train line. Oh, it's sort of, it's sort of like, is it a subway? Yeah. You guys, it's like, it's like the people mover probably, right? In Detroit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, exactly. Is it bigger than the people? All right, good. Well, uh, theirs goes in a circle. Ours goes down Main Street, right? Okay. Um, it's very useful, but 
It's very limited. So I just wonder, in yes. the scheme of things, do you see, yes. I, I just think the other thing that's remarkable about you is to have a Michigan governor who's behind clean energy when it was so hard to get people out around, you know, outside of that whole idea of the automobile using fossil fuels don't yes. change. And so I'd like to ask if you even think broader than that. Only crisis produces the opportunity for greatness, right? That's what we used to say in Michigan. It's through crisis. So it was the crisis in the auto industry that caused them to retool and to think about producing electric vehicles and getting the cafe standards higher. And there was a big ceremony with the president in the Rose Garden that celebrated this huge increase in the cafe standards. And now, look, people are buying cars made in Detroit, hand over fist. The auto industry has had the best year ever. But to your point about transit and about solutions for communities to be able to get on board with transit. To me, part of this conversation has to include sustainable communities, right? That you have to have communities that think holistically about how people are moving from one place to another and that they're locating nearby and you've got walkable communities and you've, I mean, you guys have done amazing stuff along the river. I have this, I'm in this fabulous hotel. What's the hotel we're in? The Marriott. And I've got a view that looks out over Lake Erie with the, you know, the lighthouses out there and all of the green that's all, it's so, I can't see Michigan from my room. <laughs> but I could see Canada from across the river in Michigan. But, um, but I, my point is that you guys have done some huge thinking about what makes a sustainable community here in Buffalo. And part of the conversation about energy sustainability, reducing one's CO2 footprint, being a caring for our common home is really about creating sustainable communities. And that means communities where people don't all have to have cars, where they can get to work either by foot or by transit in a way that you use transit buses that are using electric batteries and are plugging in at night or something like that. That has got to be a piece of the, of the mix. Last question, right, right, what, why, I promised I would get him, so. Sorry. Yes, sir, Hi there. Um, make name, it good. My name's Jason. Uh, I just wanted to ask you if you've um, heard or um, your thoughts about the um, study that was done by the um, Department of Energy's Oak Ridge National Laboratory that showed that they can convert carbon dioxide into usable ethanol. I was wondering if you heard of that study. I haven't heard of the study, tell me about it. Um, I'm not a chemist, I'm a political science major, uh, so I'm probably butchering this, but from my understanding of the research that was done was they um, used um, metal ions as a catalyst during the um, combustion process to create usable ethanol. Hmm. And yeah. See, those brilliant scientists at DOE uh, every day working to make this, to make this, to make, you know, to create something from something that could be potentially toxic. That's awesome. That's, I, did, I haven't read that study, but you're gonna make me wanna go look it up. Yeah, for sure. And, and know that that's just the tip of the iceberg because I think scientists across this nation every single day are trying to find solutions to, this, to these problems, particularly the climate problem, but they're all woven together. It is a, a real privilege to be in a community that, um, that really celebrates men and women for others. And it's um, great to be in a city that feels like home to me. So thank you for your graciousness. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. So thank you, Governor Granholm, for a real positive and inspiring evening. Really appreciate it. Um, thank you all for being here. And uh, be careful on your way home. And uh, go Indians. All right.